At dawn, on December 3rd, 1943, the Devil's Brigade launched one of the most daring assaults of the Second World War. On defense, you climbed your fingernails, your teeth and anything else you got to work. And we climbed and we climbed and we climbed. 60 years later, this group of soldiers has just found out how tough a climb that was. Jay was in front of me, and uh, he grabbed the rock. It was as big as, it, I couldn't put my arms around it, and there was no, I tried to push it away, but it just overtook me and smashed me right into the other granite, face first, you know. As the sun rose, the brigade was within a few hundred meters of the enemy. We watched them come out of those rock caves and emplacements and go to their weapons and get set up. They were set up for the wrong direction. Okay. That's it? Yeah. The German forces were battle-hardened and desperate. And although the Devil's Brigade had surprise on their side, the struggle for Mount Defensa was far from over. And then somebody said, OK, let them have it. And that was it. Italy's Leary Valley, vast and fertile, has been the southern highway to Rome for 2,500 years. In his 1944 documentary, San Pietro, director John Huston described it this way. Leary Valley lies in the Italian Midland, some 60 miles northwest of Naples to some 40 miles southeast of Rome a wide, flat corridor enclosed between four walls of mountains. The valley floor with its olive groves and ancient vines, its crops of wheat and corn, is green the year around. That is, in normal times. Last year was a bad year for grapes and olives. November of 1943, the Allied advance had bogged down in a sea of winter mud and fierce German resistance. San Pietro, Monte Lungo, Monte Cassino. Some of the most bitter battles of the Second World War were fought in the Leary Valley. Into the maelstrom came a group of men whose very name would chill the enemy. They were the first special service force, the Devil's Brigade. Our orders were that uh, the regiment was assigned to take a mountain called Defensa. After the Allied landings at Salerno, the U.S. 5th Army advanced rapidly towards Rome. North of Naples, they ran into a German defensive position which stretched across the spine of Italy, known as the Gustav Line. It stopped the Allied advance at a town called Casino in the Leary Valley. Overlooking the valley, and key to the German strategy, was a mountain known as La Defensa. From Defensa's peaks, the Germans could see the Allied armies in the valley below. And what they could see, they could kill.
This is Defensa today. Its tranquility masks the horrors men faced here as they fought, often hand to hand, for a small plateau near the summit, known as the Saucer. Sixty years later, the Saucer is once again home to a unit of German troops. Das ist, ich bin nur das ist mein Name ist Ralf Ziegner, ich bin 24 Jahre alt. Ich habe als Gebirgsjäger 1998 bis 1999 in Bechtesgaden gedient, also bei der, bei der Infanterie. War eine sehr schöne Zeit. Momentan bin ich als Reservist tätig. Man kann sagen, dass ich ähm, nebenberuflich. Mein Name ist Ralf Carstens, bin Obergefreiter, bin bei der Luftwaffe ausgebildet in Leck, Stadum von 78 bis 79 und bin noch im Reservistenverband RK Wiening Hall. Mein Name ist André Schmotz, ich bin 27 Jahre alt. Ich habe bei der Bundeswehr eine Ausbildung zum Reserveoffizier gemacht, die hat zwei Jahre gedauert. Ich habe dort, äh, ja, war dort als Gruppen- und als Zugführer eingeteilt. These men are all experienced soldiers who have come to Italy as part of a war game. They'll defend the saucer from a squad of Canadian and American infantry who will try and overrun it. But they've also come out of respect for the Panzer Grenadiers who fought and died here. And like those men, the soldiers have no idea when the battle will begin. But they do know the enemy is coming. These are the men they will face, Canadian and American troops who have recently finished almost a month of training in the year 1942. But not just any training, Devil's Brigade training. The first Special Service Force was history's original hunter-killer unit. The training those men took was so brutal, so intense, so unlike anything the army had taught before, the soldiers believed they could do the impossible. At Defensa, they would do just that. This was our first combat action. And we, as far as I was concerned, we wanted to, to make it a success. These soldiers will try to do what the Devil's Brigade did, scale Defensa's cliffs and overrun the German positions. And although their weapons will only fire blanks, the mission they face is very real. I mean, look at this place. You know, your avenues of approach are really constricted. You know, if you're moving up a road, you're probably going to get ambushed. So you got to get off into this, this jungle. It, it's intimidating. I mean, looking up at that, peak right there and thinking, well, we're going to have to go up there, you know, and attack this group, you know, thinking that you have to do that under fire is uh, a daunting challenge. But climbing Defensa will be more than a daunting challenge. For some, it will be the most difficult mission of their lives. I have a very, very bad fear of heights. You know, some people are afraid of spiders, some are afraid of snakes, some are afraid of heights. Oh yeah, I'll be fighting, fighting my fear of heights the whole way when we do this the climbing part. If the men are to do it the Devil's Brigade way, they'll climb the mountain at night. November 1943. The first special service force arrives in the shadow of Mount Defensa. And it was pouring rain. It was pretty rugged because it was nothing but mud. It had been raining. That was the worst winter, apparently, in Italy in I don't know how many years. Across the Liri Valley, men were wet and cold, anxious to keep their weapons dry. By the MGs, ich hab mal immer. We were always worried the machine guns would jam. They would freeze up in the cold. It was constantly snowing, wet snow. And it stuck to the metal and froze. Metal des MGs haftet geblieben und ist gefroren. If you tried to pull the trigger, nothing happened. Gedrückt hat sich nichts bewegt. I remember the rain 
I remember the food, and I remember the guns. And I figured to myself, this is going to be one hell of a war. These men have come to the Leary Valley in the dry season. Their olive grove is an oasis, not a swamp. But like the men of the brigade who paused here 60 years ago, they have no tents, no fires, and no hot food. Dinner is what soldiers call sea rations, box lunches from 1943. We have one can of chicken luncheon meat. We have graham crackers and defense biscuits. Vanilla caramels. Bullion powder. Sugar, compressed sugar. Little wooden spoons, matches, cigarettes, gum, a little can opener. On the mountaintop, the German squad prepares their meal. The Wehrmacht rations of canned meat, bread, and soup are what German troops ate when and if the supply trains got through. The difficulty lay in the constant resupplying of the frontline soldiers with ammunition and especially with food. The food carriers often had to climb up the mountain with jerry cans of soup or meat dishes and often they came late. The soup or the meat was spoiled. In 1943, the Allies patrolled this valley constantly, capturing POWs, meeting partisans, anything to determine where the German guns were. But this squad has no one to help them. So Chris Bird and Jay Budd have gone to do what any good soldier facing a tough mission would do, find out what they're up against. So we're looking for a nice, uh, natural path that's through this thick brush right here. And, uh, and a lot of times, if you just take your time, and, and you can find a natural trail that the animals use. So that's going to be the path of least resistance. Since the war, the mountain has become overgrown with thorn bushes and dense brush. Climbing Defensa's cliffs will be dangerous. Finding a route to reach them might be impossible. On the day of the assault, the squad prepares with quiet confidence. These men are soldiers from some of the finest regiments, and they've worked hard to prove themselves worthy of this mission. Looking forward to it. Just want to get up there. Yeah. It's a long go. You don't want to dishonor those guys. The advantage on any battlefield is held by those who control the high ground. These troops are expecting an assault, but they don't know how many men are coming or from which direction. So they're following the routines the Panzer Grenadiers did in 1943. Maintain the perimeter, use the cover, and wait. For the most part, the German soldiers of the Italian front came from the campaigns in France and Russia. So they were experienced soldiers, used to quietly following their orders, to doing what they were told without complaining. The Germans had everything zeroed in, and they, they're, they're looking down from the top of that mountain, and they could see an ant move, if you want to put it that way.
hundreds of artillery pieces were coordinated from Defenza's heights. The men who controlled them were dug in and almost invincible to frontal attack. But the Devil's Brigade was not the type of unit to walk into the enemy's line of fire. Colonel Frederick, the brigade commander, wanted to see the mountain for himself. So he commandeered an aircraft and flew repeatedly over the German positions. If others couldn't find a way to silence those guns, he would. The colonel made the decision when we go up, we won't take the usual route, we will never make it. Uh, we'll have to do something different. When Frederick returned, he had a plan, and this is what he decided. He would take the brigade north through the Allied front lines into no man's land, where they would hide directly below the German guns until nightfall. His scouts would then move on to the mountain, placing ropes on the undefended cliffs behind the German positions. The rest of the brigade would then climb those cliffs in the darkness and at dawn attack the Germans. Cheers, boys. To the force. 4 p.m. The long climb begins. The squad's plan is to follow the route the Devil's Brigade took and reach the foot of the cliffs before dark. But it's a long way to those cliffs, and the men have no maps. They're prepared for a long night. They have no idea. You don't want to talk to anybody. You just want to get the hell in there and get it over with. As soon as possible. You're almost, you're almost mute. I went out on patrol. Uh, Mike Meeklejohn went out on patrol, and Thomas was out on patrol. Uh, several of us, including Tom and uh, Bill Rothman, uh, went up a ways where there was a little rise that we had to climb, and we set ropes there uh, to make it easier. Yeah, the guys went up first and put in the ropes and what have you, but. Uh, they had to wait until, uh, well, I was told that it was about 900 artillery pieces put in a four-hour barrage on the mountain. Basically, they kept the, the, the Germans occupied uh, trying to stay out of the artillery barrage, and they, I wouldn't think they'd hear anything, and that was the idea. that. It would divert them, thinking something was coming from somewhere else. So many shells were fired that night, the men called Defensa the Million Dollar Mountain. Money, they said, which was very well spent. Uh, Tom ordered the battalion to get started, and we started up in pretty much single file uh, up the mountain. And we climbed, and we climbed, and we climbed, well, it was, pretty, it was a pretty steep climb. Rain showers every now and then, and uh, we could hear the artillery preparation pounding the mountain, preparing it for our final assault. PM. The squad is at rest. Wow. Right now we're at another security halt. Uh, we got a good view of the mountain. The leadership, uh, Jay and Albert, are going to get their bearings. And uh, then we're going to pick the best avenue approach up the mountain. We have to go ahead and rock and load now because these grounds, you hear that noise, right? We can't go up the mountain and do that. The weird, everyone was trying to be safe, but if anybody, that sound just travels through the. So, the climb has gone well, 
But as twilight falls, Danny Hassel is worried that Jay Budd does not know the right path to take. Did you see that trail at all? It's back there before the road forked. It looked like it was going up straight to the cliffs, right? We might as well stay in this triple canopy, but it's, it's exactly, slow. yeah, it's exactly where they went up. Okay. I'm all over it. You guys have, you know? All right, Roger that. If you want to take the tour of you know, we can go that way, but. No, it's real. All right. I'm going to talk to the machine gunners. On Defensa's summit, the German troops finish their last patrol of the day. For almost a week, they've been on edge, waiting for the attack. Klappspanten sind frei. Wenn der Feind zu nah dran ist, befehle ich Klappspanten frei. Daher den Klappspanten schon mal in die Stellung. Like any good officer, Andre Schmutz issues orders for the night. If something happens and you run out of ammo, he says, keep your head down. Nein, ihr zieht alle die Köpfe ein, wenn ihr eure Munition aufgebraucht habt. For these men, their time on Defensa has passed in a routine most soldiers know well. Moments of alarm, hours of work, days of boredom. But tomorrow will be different. Midnight. Danny's instincts were right. The squad is lost. Uh, the traveling's been pretty, uh, pretty tough since uh, the sun went down. Uh, the terrain itself is what makes it difficult. It's the fact that we can't see where we're going. A lot of the guys are carrying quite a bit of kit. One guy has a machine gun. It's really big, really heavy. Uh, apparently, we are 100 meters inferred. They think they're near the cliffs, but no one knows for sure. It's a little challenging at night. During the day, this is just a quick boulder, piece of cake. The men have approached this climb like a real special forces mission. No light, no noise, no quitting. 60 years ago, the Devil's Brigade had no choice but to do the same. Doing it in the middle of the night with dead silence, and you can't see much. As quiet as possible, you cannot move that many men with that much equipment uh, without making some noise. You weigh so much, you can hardly move. Your rifle, 45, your ammunition for both. I was carrying ammunition, some ammunition for a machine gun. I also had a jerry can of water, which just about kills you getting up there. You weigh about 300 pounds. This is not very easy, and it was cold and wet. And the mountain was very steep, so you are climbing with anything you could. And we climbed, and we climbed, and we climbed. As those men pushed forward, struggling under the weight of their combat packs, there was a moment of near catastrophe. A helmet fell. <laughs> Nobody knew that for quite a few years. No, the guy in front of me slipped on the rocks and whacked me in the head with his boot. And when you're climbing like that, you don't have a tight helmet around you, so it, it was loose, and he kicked it off. And it went down the hill. But it was raining that night and the moment passed. I was mad because at, at that time I'd, I smoked and all my cigarettes and everything were in the helmet. <laughs> 3 a.m. The squad has reached the cliffs, and they too are about to have a moment of near catastrophe. In the darkness, a rock slide. Danny Hassel is hit by a boulder the size of a truck tire. Well, Jay was in front of me, and uh, he grabbed a rock that was easily a piece of granite, bigger than I could put my arms around, and it, he stepped off, and the whole thing rolled over and just crushed me onto the side of the mountain. Uh, smashed my... How's my teeth? I chipped my teeth, yeah? I hear? Yeah, he's a little chip there. Chipped my teeth, smashed my face, crushed my whole hand. Yeah, that 
hurt, man. It felt like a baseball bat. I saw a couple white flashes. And then a little one hit me, too. I took the big one and smashed it. And then as I raised up, another one hit me again. I was like, I did say rock in the middle of it all, though. I think I, I, think I heard that. I did. I said rock, rock. It sounded pretty gnarly, man. It sounded like the mountain was coming down. I'm talking about killing the camera. I think we scattered down below. I know I did. I just went running in the dark, hoping not to run off a cliff. Yeah, I kept rolling right over top. So big, I couldn't put my arms around. Jumped off the rock, and then fetus jumped into a little cave. I mean, I heard that, and I, like, for a split second, visualized the whole squad. No, the whole squad getting wiped out. I mean, it sounded like it was freaking coming down in droves. My hand hurts, though, man. Oof. Nah, man, don't overreact. How far are we to the top? We're, we're not even halfway yet. We're not even halfway. Well, and the where's stuff, the road? The steep stuff is just <laughs> beginning. It hurts, bro. I want to hurt somebody now. <laughs> Pissed off, dude. We're just going to keep going? Because that's what we all want to do as a group, right? So we're going to the objective, and we're not going to wait till dawn. We're just going to assault it, kill everybody, and then we're going to get him medical help. Oh, that's what we want to do. So we'll finish the um, exercise. Yeah. That's right, we own the night. And we climbed and we climbed and we climbed. Ask any one of them if they ever want to do it again. The answer is no. Mind the language, when the hell are we going to get finished off of these things? Because <laughs> you were getting pooped. You, we really were. Well, you know, you see the movies and all that sort of stuff. And they climb by means of the ropes and that sort of stuff. And that's baloney. At, on defensa, you climbed your fingernails, your teeth, and anything else you can get to work. When the men left the Olive Grove, they intended to follow the route the lead platoon of the Devil's Brigade took. But the mountain had become overgrown, and the squad lost the trail. For most of the night, they fought their way through thorn bushes and thick undergrowth. And when dawn came, they were on the cliffs but hundreds of meters below the German camp. Five a.m. After a night of waiting for the next rock to fall, tensions are high. Danny's close call has spooked them. Okay, right. Be over. No more guys are coming out. Let them know. This is guys are getting bumped off this thing. At the German camp. The night has passed peacefully, but the dawn is cold. In December of 1943, the Panzer Grenadiers would also have been trying to stay warm, but the artillery barrage had them on alert. These uh, soldiers, as so far as we could tell, by and large were experienced. They'd come off the Russian front, but they were, they were very well trained, exceedingly well trained, as all German soldiers were. They knew their business. 6 a.m. Lead climber Chris Bird is beginning to think he's chosen the wrong route. I've been saying we're 50 meters for the past kilometer. good for some competent climbers. However, I don't cl count myself right now as a competent climber. Between my fear of heights and my inexperience on the rocks, this is gonna suck. After 12 hours on the mountain, the men are exhausted. They've climbed almost 3,000 feet, and there's at least one more peak to scale before they reach the saucer. Joe George has made it. The slowest climber in the squad, Joe has joined the rest of the men at the top of the cliffs. Chris Bird's instincts were right after all. He has brought them to the edge of the saucer. 
And now these men can do what Special Forces soldiers do best. Stalk the enemy. There weren't any Germans up there at that, when we got up there. We got up there, they were all in their holes. We watched them come out of those rock caves and emplacements and go to their weapons and get set up. We watched them get set up. They were set up for the wrong direction. And then somebody said, okay, let them have it. And that was it. Different men have different reactions. Uh, I, I, my reaction was I had a, got a coppery taste in my mouth. Uh, you just got to... Uh, Face it and go on. Oh, that's the machine gun. That's the machine gun. So let me see. Wait, wait, wait. You guys got nothing. You got to pull the move. Come on, let's go. And all this ammunition was coming at you. Yeah, I had some sobering moments when I heard that stuff coming in at me. Yeah, I wish I could get the hell out of here. This is no fun. We were trying very hard to protect ourselves, and there was no hole, nowhere to dig a hole. You couldn't dig holes up there. And I think the only way I got over it was action. I did something. And as soon as you start to do something, your fear dis dissipates. Sergeant John Dawson told me, take your machine gun and move it over and f start firing over at that other ridge. And on my way over, carrying my machine gun, that's when I got hit in the uh, thigh. I said, Sergeant, I said, I've been hit by a rock. And he came over, he said, you don't, he said, you've been hit by machine gun fire. Well, there was, everything was going on, machine guns, we were try, we, they had about three machine gun positions, and we were trying to get the one out, you know, and I was trying to find this guy that was, kept ducking in and out of the, behind the rocks. You try and pick him at the right time, but he got it, but I don't know whether it was me or not, because there's so much going on. There was a good regiment up there, a hell of a good regiment up there. They were pretty rough and pretty tough. And in most cases, a lot of them were a parachute regiment, like ourselves. Got no weapon. Machine gun right there. Does that work? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's go. Right, Ralph, right. Yeah. Get down, get down. 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 Chaos to the extent that you only knew what was going on in your particular immediate area. You had an objective and you worked towards that objective. 
We got one surrendering! It took the Devil's Brigade about two hours to overrun the saucer. Although the fight continued for most of the next day, the victory was assured. Defensa had fallen. For these soldiers, this is a time to recognize new friends in the uniform of old enemies. Wait. It is a time of comradeship, but most of all, a time to be thankful that the weapons only fired blanks. I shoot one magazine, two magazine, Free magazine and uh, my ammunition was over. Uh, it's it's hard to find a good cover yeah. in this direction. Yeah. Well, we saw we saw your heads bobbing there, so we knew where you guys were. Yes. When you do combat with guys with your own unit, you know you always give an enemy force like a certain section, and you know these guys and you see them all the time, and it's it's just your game's not on. But when you come up here, you've worked hard. You're both wearing different uniforms. You're you're representing the old boys, and you you see their enemy at the time, and their uniforms, and the adrenaline's going, and and everyone switched on. The attack was really good. I tell you, my adrenaline was pumping for sure. It sounds like real war, and I um, I didn't expect that, but um, but it's so real. Uh, we have no sharp ammunition, but it was really real. If you look down in that valley there, there's no way you think guys would be able to come over without being detected. What the uh, the force men did is, it's unbelievable, it's unheard of. You know, when they were young men, they were 19, 20, 22, they were young guys. And uh, yeah, you just look around at the hills and, and you think those men spent years of their life doing this, you know, years, and, and died by the hundreds and the thousands in these valleys. So yeah, you think about that all the time. Sixty years after the storming of Mount Defensa, the saucer has once again become a pasture, the domain of shepherds, not soldiers. But in the mountain's shadow lie many of the men who died on that long ago morning, soldiers who fell far from home. The soldiers of the first special service force who lie at the foot of Mount Defensa have become a legend, and the world remembers that legend. Those who survived remember the men, men like Tom McWilliam, a school teacher from New Brunswick. Tom McWilliam was a Lieutenant Colonel who commanded the 1st Battalion. Stu Hunt was his bodyguard. Guy that's leading, reading maps and all this sort of stuff, can't protect himself. I had, I was very young, and so I think uh, Colonel Williamson, uh, Colonel Mc, McWilliam, said, "Come on, kid, I'll come with me. I'll take care of you." Pulled me out of a company. He said, "You're my bodyguard." Newly married. McWilliam's wife, Harriet, had written with news of her pregnancy. The letter arrived the day before the Defensa attack. But only American troops received mail that day. Tom McWilliam went into battle, unaware of the news from home. The main battle moved off to the right, maybe a couple hundred yards. McWilliam said, 
we've got to get over to where the last of the Germans are to get at them. We got part way across, they dropped the bomb on them. Yeah, I sort of went this way and he went that way. I knew he was dead. I mean, this is not something where you got to check the pulse like they do in the, in the movies. A guy gets hit with a close mortar bomb in the open, you don't need to look for a pulse. Historians estimate 73 First Special Service Force members died that day. The German losses were in the hundreds. The Devil's Brigade took few prisoners. Under the silent watch of the storied Monte Cassino, this squad of American and Canadian soldiers have come to pay respects to the fallen. As they pause at the graves of their brothers in arms, these young soldiers see more than names carved in stone. They see the men who were once just like them. Uh, hmm. I think I'm gonna speak for most of the guys when I say this, uh, my voice is quivering. Uh, it's overwhelming. I mean, we got to walk in their footsteps, very little that it was, you know, in those three weeks before coming here for the mission in Italy. And uh, standing here is, uh, it's heavy, it's heavy on my heart. I started off by just reading the names and the regiments and stuff they're from. And I started reading the, how old they were in the comments at the bottom, and most of them are the same as, as I was. Like, the average age, I think, was early 20s, and I've seen a couple 19, a couple 20, and that's, that's me, you know? There's a lot of comments on the bottom. A lot of them had wives, and it's, it's sad. Right here in this row, there's five headstones from the force all da that are dated 3rd of December, 43, the day they took the fender. And it's just, uh, it put, helps put things in perspective that after that mock assault that we did the other day. Same, like, my regiment wasn't here, but there's a lot of people from regiments that I have friends in, and it's, it's hard, it's tough to believe that uh, that could be them. As you walk up the steps and turn the corner, uh, it, it literally takes your breath away seeing the, uh, the thousands of stones. Um, I, I can't really comprehend or even uh, begin to comprehend what um, the force would have went through going up there under fire. Uh, it's kind of, um, it just hits home. And, um, okay, next question. We sit here in the Leary Valley in this grave. Remember that they're veterans, old and young. Almost a year to the day after the victory at Mount Defensa, the first special service force held its final parade. The Devil's Brigade was no more. The military bureaucracy decided Canada's best trained troops ever could better be used as replacements. As they left the field, the Canadians saluted their American comrades and quietly vowed never to forget. Those that I remember, uh, and we remember a lot of them. Uh, you couldn't find any better no matter where you looked. We're proud to have uh, borne the colors of the first Special Service Force. 
Uh, you kind of can't believe you're stupid enough to get involved, but uh, as most people say, if uh, they needed me now, I'd go. I mean, you don't learn a hell of a lot, even after 60 years. I don't think, well, we're not looking for riches or money or medals because we was doing what we thought was important to save our country and the peace that we enjoy. And you'd be surprised what a simple thank you means. <laughs>